Good morning and welcome to the weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elric. I'm Lorna Virgili, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today are Drs. Keisha Davis, the County Health Officer, as well as Dr. Nina Ashford, Chief of Public Health Services, Mr. Sean O'Donnell, the Acting Deputy Chief of Public Health Services for the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, not afternoon, Mr. County Executive. Yes, good morning. And uh, thank you everybody for being here this morning. I had to hold the media briefing early today because um, I'm attending the joint meeting of uh, COG and WMATA later today. And this is the first ever joint board of directors meeting. Uh, the focus is on trying to create a unified vision for transit in the region, a sustainable funding model for WMATA. And this is an unprecedented opportunity for regional collaboration and action. I, I think people know that you know decisions by COG do not actually result in imposing anything on any jurisdiction. Ultimately, at the end of the day, jurisdictions have to agree to take the actions that uh, COG is proposing. But it, it's important we have this conversation. You know, we have in this metro area, we have a really strong, extensive transit network of more than a dozen bus and rail systems. Uh, and yet, you know, we not really thought about how to more seamlessly integrate all these things together. We also know that metro links in the capital region are just essential for our area. And we need to keep working to make sure the system stays operational. And if anything, you know, that we enlarge our transit network. And, you know, WMATA's problems are, you know, pretty obvious. They have, you know, lack of sustainable funding um, system for forever since the beginning. They were never adequately funded. And we, you know, we were very worried about the effects of anything that happens to WMATA that reduces ridership. Uh, I think, you know, we're about to find out on Georgia Avenue and Silver Spring this summer what happens when the rail line is not functional from uh, Lenmont all the way into the district until the Fort Totten Station. So it's going to have real impacts. And what those people do to get to work uh, could put an enormous burden on Georgia Avenue. And hopefully with our agreement to put in the bus only lanes on most of Georgia, from Glenmon South, uh, we'll be able to get some relief. But this is going to be, you know, kind of trying period of time, and we really need the jurisdictions to come together to come up with a coherent plan, and we need, you know, more cooperation, particularly from the Virginia governor, um, on making sure that they they treat Wilmot seriously. In Montgomery County, our plans are focused on expanding the reach of the red line and commuter rail rail by building the flash bus rapid transit system that links our communities and better connects the regional network that's operated by the state. And the Wamata, our BRT lines are already operating along US 29, but they're not in a true BRT pattern yet. That's part of one of the upgrades we're gonna do. And we're investing about $600 million to add BRT flash lines along Rears Mill Road from Wheaton to Rockville, which provides a, an up-county connection or mid-county connection between two ends of the red line so that people don't necessarily have to go all the way through the District of Columbia and come back out the other side on Metro to get to the west side of the county. Uh, they'd be able to go from Wheaton to Rockville and get on a Metro there going up and down Rockville Pike, which would be a much better trip for most people. Um, we're also working on uh, 355, three, the 355 project from Bethesda Clarksburg to Clarksburg is broken into three different pieces. Um, we're immediately tacking, tackling the middle piece, which is north of North Bethesda, um, the Pike District, and uh, south of uh, the Up County. But the plan is to try to get that in place first and then come back and do the lower segment. If we can get the financing, uh, we really want to open the lower segment first because we're planning a lot of economic development in that corridor. And when it was planned for Amazon, the previous governor actually included, and we're talking Larry Hogan here, included three bus rapid transit lines in that corridor in order to support the development that was planned there. And we're looking at about the same amount of development over the same time frame, And we need a commitment to build the transit that's gonna make those projects possible. 
Um, it would be crazy for us to have an asset that can drive economic development and then have it not get off the ground because we're unable to provide the transit that it needs in order to work. So more to come on that as you know, we move through the year. In addition to these two projects, we're planning a complete network, and that includes Old Georgetown Road, um, Randolph Road, Georgia Avenue, University Boulevard, New Hampshire Avenue, and expanding the US 29 flash route. And in that case, in US 29, the goal is going to be to put most of the system into dedicated lanes so it's not in mixed traffic. If it's in traffic, it's you really can't use the word BRT, and I've always been hesitant to call the 29 system a BRT because it doesn't feel anything like rapid when you're driving south of New Hampshire Avenue. Uh, we're really focused on connecting the growth areas of our county that are not on rail lines and creating alternatives for driving um, from more of our county residents. And when I planned this out, and I actually did plan it out, it was me and my uh, staff member, Dale Tibbetts, who produced the original BRT maps that came out of a conversation that we had at COG. And we laid out a little over 100 miles of BRT lanes that eventually got through the planning board and got adopted as our transit plan. But it, our focus was connecting all of the... Uh, residential areas and connecting people from where they live to where they work. And it was pretty easy to see on the maps where that was. And it's one thing about Montgomery County, not having a network of roads that operates like a grid, you can figure out pretty quickly which roads will get you east, west, and which roads will get you north, south. And it's only a few of them. And everything else is pretty local inside of a box. Um, as we work together across jurisdictions, we, uh, it hope, we hope it allows us uh, to provide even more transit choices. So I'm looking forward to today's conversation, and I'm sure you, I'll see a lot of the press down there as well. Uh, this week is National Small Business Week, and I spent some time yesterday in the Up County. Uh, my visits included a stop at Neighborhood Veterinary Associates in Clarksburg. These are four vets who collaborated to open the practice, and they now serve 7,000 patients, and a very diverse group of patients, I might add. They deal with far more animals than I imagine. And uh, they are, seem to be well-situated and have really made themselves part of the community there. I also visited 61 Vineyard in Damascus. It had launched just 10 years ago and now has a loyal fan base and award-winning wine to share with their visitors. I also got with to meet with the owners of Physical Therapy and Balance in Germantown. And these owners expanded their business that was in Frederick and they started expanded it down to Germantown in 2022 to take advantage of the opportunities here. I'm glad physical therapy and many other businesses have been able to use the resources of our business center. Um, we provide free of charge services to help businesses um, have a one-stop shop that can provide assistance for whether you're starting out, whether you're trying to grow, or whether you um, just simply want to move and locate in Montgomery County. Uh, it's, we're beginning to do the work that I envisioned. When I came into office, the local economic development part of the county government was, was basically non-functional and had been reduced as not as a single entity with the focus on the Economic Development Corporation. But the Economic Development Corporation never really had the charge to focus on local small businesses. So once I got elected, we began putting together uh, the local small business part of economic development. And I'm really glad uh, that we have the team that we have and that they're getting out in the community and working with small businesses. They make a difference when we talk to small business owners who've worked with them. They're really appreciative of the support we're able to give them now. So this is, in my mind, good news for us. Um, Seeing agriculture-related businesses thrive in our Ag Reserve also shows what a good decision it was to stop the sprawl that threatened our farmland. Companies can grow from small beginnings, which is one reason we invested in cross finds over the last, God, it must be almost a decade now when the first money started coming in. Cross finds is a unique place. It's something I proposed uh, when County Executive Mike Leggett was here. And uh, it was what it's what is called a crush pad. And the purpose is to allow farmers to enter into the winemaking business without having to make large investments while they're starting their business. If, if you're a farmer and you want to go into grapes, it takes about three years after you plant the grapes for them to mature enough 
to have a really viable harvest for winemaking. And on top of that, the equipment needed to operate a true winery, even at a small scale, can be north of a million dollars. And so what we did is we've uh, created this crush pad and it allows farmers to plant and harvest their grapes and bring them to the crush pad where, as the name suggests, they get crushed. And the juice is processed into wine. We provide stainless steel and wooden barrels for storage and a bottling line. We have technical staff that can help a person make their own wine or they can uh, they can hire a winemaker directly and make their wines uh, with the winemaker of their choice. And this lets farmers um, bring their, their wine to market and not have to have all this in a facility on their farm. The goal is to get them to grow to the point where it's, they're able to add these facilities um, on their own on their own farms, but it's a place to get a jump started. I saw this when I was out in California more than a decade ago. A number of crush pads around the state and also elsewhere that had given opportunities for farmers to get into the winemaking business. So wine is actually pretty lucrative as a crop. If you grow grapes, grapes leave the farm as the number five valued agricultural product, but if they leave in a bottle, they're the number two agricultural product. So there's a lot to be said for fostering this industry. And you know, our goal, my goal from the beginning was to create the kind of wine country that you see over in Northern Virginia. We know we can replicate it here. We have a lot more people getting into the wine business now. And uh, for you, who, you know, you don't follow all the wine news. Uh, it turns out Montgomery County actually has really good land, not through the whole county, but in parts of the county that are it is ideally suited for winemaking and, and grape growing. And so we're excited that we have land that we can actually do this on, much like uh, the land that Northern Virginia has. And if you're up there, if you want to visit Cross Vines um, and get an idea of what, what the facility looks like, it also has an excellent restaurant. It got really highly rated and it's on the golf course up there. So you could combine a tour of a winery, uh, play around the golf and eat lunch or dinner there. It's, it's a great place. Um, other news, uh, in case everybody missed the campaign ads, uh, early voting begins tomorrow. And I want to remind everyone, early voting begins at 14 early voting sites around the county. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, Thursday, May 2nd through Thursday, May 9th. And you can get more information at elections.maryland.gov. And tomorrow evening, I'll give the, this year's State of the County address at the Executive Office Building in Rockville. The public and the media are, of course, invited to join us at 7.30 p.m. And I hope I see you all there. Uh, next week, uh, we begin about a two-week trip to Korea and China. And, and a couple of us uh, from the county's economic development effort, along with um, some businesses in Montgomery County, um, are going to Korea, where we're going to attend BioKorea. And we'll be meeting with companies seeking to expand in the U.S. and talking to them about the reasons that our county is a very attractive option. And we'll also be meeting with companies in the tech sphere. And for all these companies, the Institute of Health Computing, and particularly its AI component, are very attractive. Following Korea, we go to China, where we'll continue to do the same work. We already have meetings set up with industry groups in the biofield, as well as um, industrial groups. There are companies seeking to expand into U.S. markets. And as with any potential biopartner, our strengths and talent density of companies, the presence of NIH, and other federal facilities, and especially the FDA, which is the gateway to getting drugs into the U.S. market, all reasons to make us a very attractive landing place. And we've seen a lot of landing here. Uh, when I was elected, there was no lab space being built in Montgomery County. Today, we've got 5 million square feet that have either been built or in the process of being built. So we're definitely growing in this sector. And a number of our own companies are joining us because they're looking for opportunities to expand into Asian markets. We did the same thing. We went to India and Vietnam. We brought a lot of U.S., Maryland-based, Montgomery County-based companies with us as they were seeking opportunities abroad, just as we were hoping to attract companies in those countries to come to Montgomery County. And uh, we had success in our past trips, and we anticipate more progress here. 
Uh, people have actually, actually asked to set up meetings with us and invited us to tour facilities there. So we know that there's a real interest in our presence and we hope uh, we continue to take advantage of this. It's it's a big part of diversifying our economic base. You know, we this county was long known basically as a federal city. And, you know, the huge number of our employees work for the federal government or for state and local government. Uh, as those jobs, particularly in the federal government, either stopped expanding or began shrinking, uh, we've needed to pivot to other things. And life sciences has been really important for us and it continues to help us grow. Um, but we're looking at other things as well. We're, light manufacturing offers opportunities. I was up at um, Use Networks, which opened the facility at the Montgomery College campus in Germantown. They have 400 people in, involved, hired there, who are um, building satellite antennas. And it's a major robotic-driven uh, uh, industrial facility. And so we know we can put these things in Montgomery County. So we're looking to offer more opportunities, not just in life sciences, but in the industrial area as well. Light industrial, we're not talking about heavy factories with uh, massive amounts of pollution. We're talking about the cleaner tech that's being done today. So before I open it up to questions, I'd like to give my staff an opportunity to provide any updates they wanna share, and then we'll start with our health team. Any updates? No updates for me, thank you. Not for me either, thanks. Dr. Sauter, any updates? Nothing for me, thank you. No. Okay, so we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers right now. Members of the media, do raise your hand. I see Maureen Chassac from Montgomery Community Media has questions. We do have a 1045 hard stop today. Go ahead, Maureen. Thank you. Uh, uh, for Mr. Elrich, on the upcoming trip, can you just say what day are you leaving and uh, what day will you be getting back? Um, I leave on the 5th. I get there on Monday and we come back. I think I come back on the 21st. I leave there Thank on you. Sunday and get back Monday morning. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Kate Ryan, WTOP. Good morning, Kate. Good morning. Thank you for this. I wanted to ask about this um, joint meeting later today. And, you know, you talked about COG right now doesn't have uh, the authority to impose any of the um, recommendations they may have. And out of this, I'm looking at their board of directors uh, uh, agenda, and it says there will be a, a, an adopted joint resolution. How is this different from previous efforts and do you sense that more jurisdictions are going look we do need to create much more of an integrated system so that if someone who uses the ride-on from bethesda hops onto the metro and then wants to dash in alexandria it's easier what what do yeah. you think is come out of this so, I, mean, I served on cog for my 12 years i was on the transportation board there in my 12 years as a council member and you know COG has always been advisory to the counties. And so we try to reach consensus positions at COG that we can then propose to our you know, local jurisdictions. Uh, sometimes it, you, know, you don't reach contents, consensus on things that you're not, you know, you're not able to do. Virginia, for example, had some very different laws about the ability of their counties to legislate in certain areas. So things that uh, we can do, they can't do. Uh, but I think this is, you know, the first real effort, you know, that I've seen of bringing everybody together and say, let's try to figure out how we map this out. We have all these assets. Can we make them work better together? And I think this is a real, you know, driving force here is to figure out how we make the best use of all our transit as assets. All of us are trying to, you know, bring more jobs into the area. Um, and we understand, I think, pretty well that there has to be an ability to move people other than by car, because otherwise it becomes extraordinarily diff difficult. And if you rely on fully uh, working from home, that doesn't necessarily grow your base in the sense of you don't you don't have to you're not renting office buildings or building facilities. So 
everybody's got an interest in trying to make sure we can move people, we can move people efficiently. I think everybody understands that if Metro is allowed to decline, whether it's simply not funded and they cut services, or whether they're not able to maintain and provide you know services people expect it, that all those things would be bad for us. The implications, I mean, I, I would just invite people to ponder what would happen and we're going to see this on Georgia Avenue. What happens when all these people who ride this, tens of thousands of people, all of a sudden can't ride it? And how are they going to how are they going to get to work? And what is driving going to be like? And while there would normally be buses, the buses would normally be stuck in traffic, which is why the state's letting us use the curb lanes um, to provide the you know a faster, more like a rapid bus system service in order to move people quickly and make it worth their while. To get on a bus. I will say I, I'm kind of optimistic that this bus experiment could actually be beneficial because you know Metro only stops at a few places. Buses have far more stops along the line. So there are opportunities to pick up riders who otherwise, you know, just don't bother trying to get to a metro station because limited parking and everything else. If we have more rapid, more more stops, hopefully we pick up more riders than we normally would. And hopefully we get to see what the potential is for attracting new people. But hopefully the region, I, th I think everybody understands the severity of what we're dealing with. Well, if I can follow up just briefly, I know that in a lot of 24 operation, hour operations like our own, like hospitals, um, I've talked to young people who go, I'm stuck having an Uber if I need to get into work for a 3 a.m. shift kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, do you foresee a time when we will have 24 hour service uh, and and that, as you say, doesn't loop around the way the red line does? I, I, I don't know if it's if we're going to get the 24 hour service. That's that's a, a big lift for the system. I do think they can go, go back to extended hours. I mean, if you've got people working till two o'clock in the morning and you've got it, you know, whether it's Montgomery County, which has a nighttime economy, which now goes, you know, on the weekend goes to 3 a.m. and D.C. does too. There's a lot of workers who are stranded if there's no transit. And the buses simply just aren't adequate. Even if even if you could get where you wanted on a bus, the number of them that run aren't enough to really move the number of workers who need to be moved. So I think, you know, we're going to have to look at what it's going to take for us to move, you know, move to expand hours to when people really need it. I don't know if it needs to be 24. But I think it, we need to expand them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Members of the media, any more questions, please raise your hand. No more questions today? Can I get another one in? Yes, you can. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you very much. I know you talked about this last week, and I think you, you have made the case today about when the red line work begins this summer, the challenges that that it will have. What are you hearing from uh, constituents about, wait a minute, I'm confused. I use Mark. How can I get from point A to point B? What kind of um, public service campaign, the way you guys have done in the past, uh, has Metro done a good job of that? Do you see more of that needing to be done? Well, I think it really has to be ramped up now. We're, you know, we're getting close to the point when this is going to happen. And you know, I think Metro did its announcement. We all know kind of what to expect. State Highway worked with us to deal with the, you know, the George Avenue corridor, which is a big deal. Um, but I think people are going to have to, um, we're going to have to inform more people about this. And it's very likely this is going to happen uh, next year on the other side of the red line. So. This will not be our last um, visit with this kind of problem. So hopefully we get enough of a publicity campaign that people aren't confused or don't wonder what happened when the train didn't show up one morning. Got it. And then when you mentioned the bus line on Georgia Avenue and, and the work with yeah. um, SHA, what, what lines are those roughly? Well, it's just, it's going to be a line that runs from the Glenmont station down to ultimately Fort Totten. Okay, these are the shuttles. These they're they're called they're called shuttles. They're going to be buses designed to handle the passenger load that used to be on the train. So it's going to be probably a lot of buses. Got it. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Kate. Members of the media, any more questions this morning? No more questions? I guess we're done for today. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Stay safe. Bye, everyone. Bye.